OK, so this next module is called Access Carriers. Again, uh, I, uh, the way that I've ordered the modules is according to the textbook, so you can look up things easily. Uh, but really, this module is, is, is just a continuation of, uh, of last module. What we're going to be talking about is the carrier processes and life cycle. Okay. Uh, these are the sort of the basic concepts, the ABCs of, of how carriers behave that I would like you to understand for the purposes of this class. If you know these basic concepts, it will really help you understand not only the devices that we will cover in this class, but also the devices that you may cover in, uh, in future courses future devices that, that, uh, uh, that are based just on these uh, basic principles. So what are these principles that I'm talking about here? These are the, the four basic carrier processes. Okay, and uh, so we covered some of them in the previous module. We'll cover, uh, we'll cover some more in this module. Uh, the four carrier processes are as follows. So up here we have the, the generation of a carrier. So this is the creation of a carrier. This is the annihilation, or the death of a carrier down here. That's recombination. But starting up here, <coughs> the way that you can generate carriers. Now, one way we can do this is by heat. So I was asking this question a few minutes earlier. How, uh, what happens to electron concentration as, as you increase the temperature? The answer was, well, if you increase the temperature, the electrons get enough energy to go from the conduction band to the valence band. If you increase this temperature sufficiently high. So that's one way to generate carriers. Another way to generate carriers, which we're going to talk about in this module, is that we're going to talk about how you can generate carriers using light. So can, any, can anyone imagine how you generate carriers using light? Let's just do this as a thought experiment. When we were talking about heat, we said, well, if, if you increase the temperature enough, that'll give the electrons enough energy to go into the conduction band. How do you think it would be the case with light? Energy from the photons. Yeah. Exactly. Energy from the photons. If the energy of the photon exceeds the band gap, then you can also get an electron to go into the conduction band, thereby creating an electron hole pair. All right, so previous module, we talked about temperature. This module, we talk about generating carriers due to light. Uh, um, another way you can modulate the number of carriers in a material or change the number of carriers is by doping. And we found that by doping a material, n-type or p-type, n-type you create more electrons and then p-type you create more holes. So that's the first of the four carrier processes. Now once you create a carrier two things can happen and these two <coughs> things are drift and diffusion. These are two ways that a carrier can move. So if there is an electric field, the carrier moves uh, uh, as a result of the force exerted by the electric field. That's what we talked about last module. So that's why this is on the left here. So drift is a movement of carriers due to electric field, and that depends on the mobility mu. This, is, this was last chapter. And uh, uh, if you recall, Ohm's law, you know, when you put a voltage across a resistor, V equals IR, that type of current is drift current. The voltage creates an electric field. The electric field propels the carriers from one place to, uh, from one side to the other. And the movement of carriers is current. Right? This mobility is one of the factors that determines the resistance of a material. On the right side here, we have diffusion. This is what we're going to talk about in this chapter. Diffusion is the movement of carriers due to a concentration gradient. So very simply, if you have a high concentration of electrons on one side and a lower concentration of electrons on the other side, the electrons will diffuse from high concentration to low concentration. This is very similar to the concept if, uh, if you take a beaker right, and you put a drop of food coloring in there. You know, where you drop that food coloring is, is very, uh, um, the concentration is very high at that point, right? But eventually, over time, the, the concentration of those, uh, the food dye spreads out through the entire beaker, right? 
So that's, that is movement of molecules from high concentration to low concentration. Similarly, electrons, uh, electrons and holes will do the same thing. They actually move, they diffuse from high concentration to low concentration. And that diffusion is dependent on this diffusion coefficient d. Okay, so just like the uh, drift currents are dependent on the mobility mu, uh, diffusion, the rate of diffusion depends on the diffusion constant d. So it turns out that d and mu are related to one another. We'll get to that later. Okay, so last module covered drift. This module will cover diffusion. Uh, we're also going to cover, continue talking about recombination in this module. Recombination is the <coughs> annihilation of an electron and hole when they, uh, when they collide, when they come to the same place. Okay, the electron, remember the, the electron is, is a carrier that's moving about the lattice. A hole is an incomplete bond. If an electron finds an incomplete bond, it'll often jump into that bond. Therefore, the electron and the hole are both disappeared. That's recombination. And this depends on uh, carrier concentration. The higher the carrier concentration you have, the more likely. The more holes and electrons you have, the more likely that the holes and electrons are going to bump into each other, right? Let me say that again. Okay, recombination is when an electron and a hole collide together, and, and the electron and hole basically annihilate one another. The electron occupies the hole, and they both disappear. The more electrons and the more holes you have, the higher the probability that they're going to collide together. Right? So this is dependent on concentration. Okay, so those are the four carrier processes. Now, the carrier life cycle refers to this idea that um, this, these processes are happening all the time. Okay, a carrier is generated. So an electron goes up into the conduction band, you generate an electron hole pair. While the electron is alive or while the hole is alive, it can either drift or diffuse, depending on whether you have an electric field or a concentration gradient. And then eventually that elect uh, electron will recombine, the electron or hole recombines. So this all happens within a very short time period. That's described by the carrier lifetime, tau. The average time that a carrier lives, in other words, the average time between the generation event and the recombination event, that delta t is equal to the carrier lifetime. Okay. For humans, our lifetimes are, you know, uh, what our life ex expectancy is, what, 80-some years now? It's gone up quite a bit since the 1950s. Uh, the carrier lifetime for electrons and holes are, you know, usually on the order of nanoseconds, picoseconds. The thing is, these processes are happening over and over again. Okay. There's, <laughs> not to get too philosophical, but it's like, it's birth and rebirth. An electron will be generated, it'll go up into the conduction band, it, it'll recombine after a few fem femtoseconds, but then it'll be reborn again. <laughs> but I'm not going to get into that because this is not a religions class. Okay, so what are the topics we're going to cover in this class? So um, last module we talked about carrier generation due to changes in, in temperature and doping. This module we're going to talk about creating carriers through light. Last module we talked about drift. This module talks about diffusion. So these are two mechanisms of carrier movement. And then we'll just talk a little bit more about recombination. <coughs> Specific topics. We're going to start by talking about optical carrier generation, steady state, and transient situations. Talk about direct and indirect recombination. Then we'll talk about diffusion. And then finally, we'll tie everything together using something called the continuity equation. So these four carrier processes we can incorporate all of those processes into something called the continuity equation. This is a very fundamental equation that's basically a statement of conservation of charge. Okay. It's a very fundamental thing, just like you can use you know, um, conservation of mass, conservation of energy, you can apply those basic principles to a whole bunch of different problems in mechanics and physics. This idea of conservation of charge can be applied to any type of semiconductor device. So the continuity equation really is, um, uh, it ties together all the concepts that we've learned thus far. And if you were to analyze a new device that you haven't seen before, you'd start by uh, um, using the continuity equation to model what the carriers are doing in the material.
All right, so we'll end the, the chapter with that. In terms of difficulty, uh, this, uh, this chapter, I think, uh, historically has been the most difficult one for, uh, for students. Okay, so if you can understand this module, the previous one, like all these like fundamentals, then understanding the devices, the diodes and the MOSFETs that we're going to cover in the next two modules will be much easier. Okay, this is kind of like the end of the first half of the course. first half of the course is all about fundamentals. The second half of the course is about uh, the two different devices that we're going to look at. All right, so it's very important that you understand uh, these concepts. Um, that being said, uh, I, I want to encourage more, uh, more questions in the class. So uh, at, at points, I'll stop. You know, Every few slides, I'll, I'll just stop at, at certain points. And I want you guys to, to ask questions, even if you think those questions may be, um, you know, may, may be ill-formed or whatnot. Just, just go ahead and ask them. We'll, it'll give me an idea of what, uh, what we need to spend more time on. <clears throat> So that being said, how about at this point, are there any uh, any questions so far? Just on the stuff we've talked about. Okay. So let's start with carrier generation. So like I said, last module we were talking about carrier generation through increases in temperature. And this module is, uh, is about optical excitation. So carrier generation involves electrons being elevated into the conduction band Eventually, they lose their energy and recombine with the hole in the valence band. So this basic uh, uh, process of generation. Okay, you've seen this diagram many times before, so it's going to be nothing new. So you have the conduction band here, valence band here. So generation, the process of generation is when an electron goes from the uh, valence to the conduction band, and this creates an electron and a hole. So this is referred to as an electron hole pair, right? Because they're being formed in pairs. So there's two ways that we can do this. In the first module, uh, we talked about if if you uh, um, increase the temperature of the system, then the electron acquires enough energy uh, to go up into the conduction band. Now for silicon, you actually have to drive it up to quite high temperatures in order to do this. You know, above uh, above 400, 500 Celsius or more. Okay, uh, so it's not as useful to generate carriers with temperature. Okay, one way that you can generate another way that you can generate carriers very quickly, very rapidly, is by light. The process is still the same. The electron is going into the uh, conduction band here, creating an electron in a hole. However, like we said, like you're doing it uh, using light. And the requirement is, so what kind of energy do you need to put into the system? The energy must be greater than the band gap. Remember, this is the band gap energy. What was the band gap energy for silicon? 1.12 electron volts. That's right. All right. So the energy of the light coming in has to be greater than 1.12 electron volts. Now I want to make this distinction. Uh, you, you've heard this in <laughs> physics before. The energy of the light is different than the power of the light. What's the difference between, what are we talking about when we, when we talk about power and what are we talking about with, with energy? What's the difference between the two? Power is a rate of energy consumption. Power is a what? The rate at which you use energy. <laughs> Okay, the power is the rate at which you're using energy. So, the, you know, if you're turning on a light bulb, if, let's say you're turning on an LED, okay, since a lot of our light bulbs are LED. So, um, the power is how much current is running through the LED. 
Okay. To be more specific with what Andrews was saying, he mentioned the rate. The power of the LED is the number of photons given off per second. It's the number of photons. It's how many photons are being given off. And how does that differ from the energy? How many photons you have is power. The ability of the photon is the same. Mm-hmm. The energy of the photon has to do with its wavelength. Mm-hmm. This is this is a key concept. Power versus energy. Um, I'm sorry. The, the the power of light versus the energy of the photon. Okay. The power is just like if if you turn up the um, if you have a blue LED. Okay. If you just ramp up, if you run more current through the LED, the LED is going to give off more light, right? That does not change the energy per photon. It's just increasing the number of photons that's hitting your eyeball. It appears brighter. The energy of a photon is really determined by its wavelength. So the energy of light is equal to, um, sorry. Who's misbehaving today? Bear with me here. Okay. So the energy of a photon is equal to HF. H is Planck's constant, and F is the frequency of the light. We also have this relationship, C is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. So the frequency is equal to C over lambda. So the energy of the light is HC divided by lambda. Okay, these are some concepts that we covered in the previous module, right? When we were talking about photons, yes? So that, uh, the power has something to do with the intensity and the color. Yes. So let, let's write that down. The power power and the intensity. This is the number of photons photons per second. The energy the energy of the light is determined by wavelength. So the power is the number of photons per second, and this is determined uh, by the current. (coughs) The current in the light source. Let's just say let's just say we have an LED light source. It's also determined by the size of the LED. The more the more area you have of the LED, the more photons will be given off. It's basically the number of photons per second being given off. That's the optical power. The energy per photon, so let me specify this here just so we're being absolutely clear. So the energy of the light, the energy of the photon is determined by the wavelength. Okay, and that's given by this Planck's uh, constant or given by Planck's equation. So ultraviolet light, if I had a tiny, (laughs) this is just to drive the point home, okay? If I just had a tiny ultraviolet light source and a gigantic red light bulb, okay? The tiny ultraviolet light source is still going to have more energy because the wavelength of ultraviolet light is smaller than red light. Ultraviolet light is 350 nanometers, red light is 600 some nanometers. Right, so the energy for, for ultraviolet light will be twice as much as red light. 
regardless of how big the red bulb is. Okay? Anyway, the reason why I'm, I'm driving that point home so much is because if you want a generation event to occur in, in a semiconductor, the energy must be greater than the band gap. We'll do some calculations with that so you can see. Okay, if, if the energy is greater than the band gap, the electron will basically go up to the band gap. The, in fact, is not being friendly to me today. Let's go back to this. We'll come, come back to this in a second. OK, so uh, carrier generation involves electrons being elevated into the conduction band. All right, eventually, they'll recombine. So let's get into this optical carrier generation. So uh, this is a typical experiment that's done. Light is absorbed on a semiconductor sample, and uh, uh, that results in the absorption of carriers. You can zoom in on this here. This is what the experiment looks like. So you'll have your sample here. Okay? The sample means just a little block of semiconductor material. This is the semiconductor material that you want to study. What you're doing is you're shooting light at it. And the, uh, the light source is attached to a monochromator. Does anyone know what a monochromator is? Exactly. It allows you to it allows you to choose a certain wavelength of light. Okay, so you're choosing the energy of the light. Okay, that uh, uh, that light goes into uh, uh, goes uh, into the semiconductor sample, and then you're measuring the amount of light that's passed through the semiconductor sample by putting a detector on the opposite end. The more light the semiconductor absorbs, the less light is going to be passed in, into the detector. Right, so by doing this, what, what you're measuring is the semiconductor's absorption coefficient. Right, how much light the semiconductor absorbs, basically. Now, what do you think will happen if what do you think will happen if we uh, 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 decrease the wavelength <coughs> of the light source? That's it. Uh, if we decrease the wavelength, we're going to get more energy light. If we get more energy light, what do you think? How, how do you think the semiconductor will interact differently with the light? Less detection. What's that? You say if the wavelength is decreased, then most of the energy will be absorbed by the semiconductor. If the if the energy is what? I mean, if the wavelength is smaller, then that means that the semiconductor is likely to absorb more of the energy of the light. Absolutely, exactly. Why why will the semiconductor absorb more energy? At, Higher energies, why will the semiconductor absorb the light? Because most of them will go into moving the electrons from the exactly. Point of the exactly. Yeah, that, that's exactly what happens. Let's go back to um, this slide here, right? The the requirement again is that the energy has to be greater than the band gap. So what happens if the light does not have sufficient energy? The light actually passes right through the material. H how many of you have seen silicon? How many of you have seen a piece of silicon? Okay, it's like shiny, right? So at uh, uh, at visible wavelengths, like visible light, actually has enough energy to create um, to uh, cre to do carrier generation in, in silicon. But if you use low energy light, if you use infrared light, for example, infrared light will go right through silicon. It's pretty interesting. So one of the ways that they actually do characterization, certain types of characterization in silicon, as, as you may know, is that they use infrared light to kind of look through. They use uh, sil um, to look through infrared light to look through the silicon wafer, and they can look at the metal interconnects on one side of it. Okay, so silicon is actually transparent to infrared radiation, but it's not transparent to visible light because visible light has a lower wavelength, higher energy than than infrared light. So 
that's the purpose of this experiment. What will happen in a typical experiment is that you're going to uh, uh, bring the wavelength down. As you bring the wavelength down, the semiconductor will start absorbing light. And when you start absorbing light, then there's going to be less light going into, into the te detector because more of the light is being absorbed by the sample. So this is governed by this equation here. All right, this is IT, the transmitted light. That's the amount that goes through the silicon. And then there's IO. This is the incident light. This is the light that's going into the silicon. IT is equal to IO times E to the negative alpha L. There's an exponential relationship here. <coughs> L is the length of the semiconductor, meaning like if you look, uh, if you look at this diagram, it's actually the thickness. The thickness of the semiconductor material is L. And there's also alpha, this absorption coefficient. The absorption coefficient is the one that's wavelength dependent. OK, so let me just ask a question then. What's the absorption coefficient going to be at low wavelengths, at small wavelengths? Higher. It's going to be higher, absolutely, because the silicon is absorbing more light. Uh, just remember that this exponential relationship, if you have a large factor here, if you have a large absorption coefficient, that will mean that this exponential value is going to be, um, it's going to drive this right side of the equation to zero quicker. Um, it's going to drive the... Uh, 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 drive this value to the right side of the equation, um, it's going to drive it lower, right? So the higher the absorption coefficient, the lower the uh, transmitted light through the sample. So that's what we're looking at over here, uh, this, this plot right here. Now let's start from the uh, principle again. Again, if the energy of the incident light is greater than the band gap, then a carrier will be generated. And um, if it's not greater than the band gap, if the, if the energy of the light is less than EG, well, then you're go um, the photon will not be generated, or the photon will not be absorbed. Light will pass directly through the material. And I gave you this example earlier. Silicon is transfer transferred to uh, wavelength. This equation I also gave you earlier, the energy of the incident light is dependent on the wavelength. So the absorption coefficient in the previous equation, all right, again, the absorption coefficient is tells you how much light the, the sample absorbs. That's here on the y-axis. What's going on with my... Let me save this for a second and restart it. It's behaving funny. <coughs> All right, so looking at this chart here, so this is, um, this is the absorption coefficient on the y-axis, and on the x-axis we have the energy of the light. Okay, the energy of the light is given in electron volts. Notice that once, it, it, if the energy of the incident light exceeds the band gap, okay, so this is Eg, then you'll notice that the absorption coefficient will suddenly increase because now the set, now uh, electron hole pairs are being generated in the material. All right. So if we look at that for a few different materials, this is this is the trend that we'll see. This type of experiment, so I uh, the the setup that you saw on the previous slide is a way to actually measure the band gap of a material. If you just increase the energy of the light and suddenly see the sample absorbing beyond a certain uh, energy, then you'll know that th that was the band gap of the material. So they basically just sweep the energy of the light, and when they see abs the absorption go way up, that's how they figure out the band gap. So these are the band gaps of, of, uh, uh, of different materials, or these are the, the, uh, the types of light that they'll absorb. If we look at silicon, for example, Silicon is here on this diagram. Silicon has a band gap of 1.12 electron volts. So that's here. 
the, cor the wavelength of light corresponding to that, which we can solve with Planck's equation, E equals <coughs> hc over lambda, that corresponds to about, about 1,100 or 1,200 nanometers. So anything, any wavelength above 1100 or 1200 nanometers on this part, this side here, any wavelength above that so it will pass right through silicon. Any wavelength below it, okay, so the higher energy light, visible light, ultraviolet light, they will actually get absorbed by silicon. Turns out this is actually quite useful for us because, you know, uh, if we want to make cameras, you know, silicon is used as a light sensor in a digital camera, right? The type of cameras you have in your cell phones. Silicon is very good at absorbing visible light. You can see that um, visible light appears in this portion of the spectrum, so silicon can absorb that, that type of light. So since silicon makes great uh, uh, light detectors for visible light. Yes? So if we had a gallium phosphorus or whatever GAP is, then uh, as a sensor for semiconductor for a camera, then we would be missing yellow slash green in the picture? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, good point. So um, uh, if, if we were to use gallium, uh, uh, gallium phosphide, right, then uh, the, this has a band gap of showing about 2.2, uh, 2.3 electron volts here. So the wavelength corresponding to that is somewhere in the 0.6 uh, 0.6 micron or 600 nanometer range. That's red light. So that that, that that would be the cutoff. You could see light below red, but um, you wouldn't be able to see it above. So actually, that I'm sorry, that would it wouldn't be yellow. You'd be able to see yellow and green, but you wouldn't be be able to see red. All right. Silicon fortunately falls over here, so everything this part that falls in the in the uh, um, this portion of the spectrum. <coughs> Okay. So uh, uh, another point, just, in, just just interesting trivia. And like, if you want to develop um, some a camera that can detect infrared, then you have to use these types of materials over here on the left. Okay, those types of materials are more expensive to work with, so that's why infrared cameras, those night vision cameras that the military sometimes uses, those are. They're more expensive because they're made from more exotic materials. All right. Any questions so far on absorption? Any questions? This slide is actually from uh, Hamamatsu. Hamamatsu is a, is a company that sells various types of light detection equipment. Thought this might be of interest to some of you because you know this is an application, big application of semiconductors is for detecting light and other types of electromagnetic energy of various types. I mentioned that silicon is a great material for uh, detecting visible light, so we use them in our digital cameras, and silicon is also used in solar cells. This process of optical carrier generation is the basis for solar cells <coughs> as well. Okay, it's the same the same principle. So, so this chart from Hamamatsu just shows uh, the different types of devices and technologies that are used to detect lights of different electromagnetic energy of different uh, wavelengths and energies. So in the 400 to 700 nanometer range, that's the visible portion of the spectrum. This is what we can see with our naked eye. As I mentioned, like silicon is very good at that. So they use silicon. It's also very cheap. So... Uh, photodiodes, avalanche photodiodes, um, these are sensitive uh, detector, light detectors that are made from silicon. If we want to detect infrared, like I said, we have to use some more exotic materials like lead, selenium, uh, indium, gallium, arsenide. Those are common materials that are used in uh, um, uh, infrared uh, light detectors. Now, uh, semiconductors... You know, silicon can detect light down to about 200 nanometers, but then you run into this other problem, which we're not going to be talking about in this class. I'll just mention it to you, is that like light with very high energy ends up going through silicon because 
of the way that the, the photons interact with material. You need to have like thick pieces of silicon if you want to absorb very high energy light. I don't want to go into the details of that because I don't want to confuse you all with, with the main concept here that we're talking about. Okay, that's that's a second order effect. So, um, if we want to detect, um, if we want to detect things at, at very high energies, gamma rays and X rays, you can use uh, um, certain types of semiconductors to detect these. But um, commonly, what is done is that they have uh, these other types of sensors used for X ray detection. Even like film type sensors are used there. Semiconductors can be used to detect these, and they they have. Um, they are used, but sometimes you have to modify them a little bit. For example, if you want to detect X-rays, you'll put a um, you'll put a film on top of the silicon uh, phosphor coating that uh, takes an X-ray and converts it to visible light. So you'll get a pop of visible light whenever you get X-rays on there, and the visible light is then detected by the silicon. So those are sort of a more indirect way of doing it. Okay, and and down here there's some other types of uh, uh, light sensors. I thought you might find this interesting. Silicon and semiconductors obviously play a very important role in uh, uh, high quality light detectors. Okay, I think we'll go for just a couple more minutes and then we'll we'll, we'll get to a stopping point. Now, uh, generation and recombination at equilibrium. So uh, if we are at equilibrium, equilibrium, you remember from physics, is when the processes are balanced. When we're talking about generation and recombination, if they're balanced, then that's what we refer to as equilibrium. All right, conceptually think about this. What, if, what would happen if the generation and recombination rates were not equal to each other? So let's say you had more generation <coughs> happening than recombination. What, what would happen in the material? So th think about the uh, energy band diagram here. Let's, sorry, let's go to the desktop here. All right, so this this process of generation. What, what would happen if the electrons kept on going into the conduction band? It stopped conducting, yeah. Well, eventually the valence band would become completely empty, and the conduction band would be completely full. Right? What I'm mentioning to you is a very nonsensical type situation. Okay. It, 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 do, it just doesn't happen. Like the, the generation rate and the recombination rate are equal to each other. The number of electrons going into the conduction band per second is equal to the number of electrons recombining per second. Okay, so the generation, uh, the generation and recombination rates are equal to each other. And GI is equal to RI. All right, and this, uh, the G and generation and recombination rates, GI and RI, are both equal to alpha R times N0 times P0. And N0 times P0, you remember from last chapter, is equal to NI squared. NP equals NI squared. All right, so this simplifies to... Uh, uh, alpha r times ni squared. So this constant here, this is the recombination rate constant, is temperature dependent and excitation uh, dependent. All right. Now, let's think about this. What will happen at a higher temperature? What will happen to alpha r at a higher temperature? More, more general question. What will happen to the generation rate at higher temperatures? It increases. Right. So what will happen to the recombination rate at higher temperatures? It will also increase. They both increase at the same time. Right? Because the two have to be equal to each other. So keep that in mind. At higher temperatures, you're increasing the generation rate, but you're also increasing the recombination rate. All right. So we have alpha r and i squared. So the intuition behind here, statistics would intuitive, intuitively say that the recombination rate is proportional to the number of electrons and holes present. The more holes and electrons there are, the higher the likelihood that a recombination event will occur. Right? 
the more electrons and holes you have, the more recombination happens. So the more electrons and holes you have, that means the more generation will happen as well, because the two processes are in equilibrium. All right. So uh, as you increase concentration, the generation rate increases. As you increase the concentration, the recombination rate increases as well at a specific temperature. Uh, questions? Okay, we will start with this question next time. So we're going to talk about this basic process of generation followed by recombination. The, the general concept is this, and we're going to go into much more detail on Tuesday. Uh, so the first thing that happens over here on the left So the photon gets uh, uh, photon gets absorbed here, so that causes the electron to go from here up to uh, uh, up to this energy. Notice that the electron is actually going to um, it's not just going to the edge of the conduction band; it's going significantly above the conduction band. Okay, this just re it just really depends on how much energy of the light that you have. If you have a lot of energy, the electron will get bumped up to a very higher energy level. Okay, so the electron goes up to this higher energy state. It loses some of its energy through scattering events. Okay, imagine, remember the electron is always, uh, um, there's always scattering happening, lattice scattering and purity scattering. That causes the electron to lose energy. Every time the electron collides, it loses some amount of energy. So the electrons are going to lower and lower energy states. After a certain amount of time, it gets to the edge of the conduction band, and then it drops all the way down here. Okay, remember that there's no, there are no energy states within the band gap. Right, so once it gets to the edge here, the next lowest energy state that the electron can find is all the way down here. So that's why it takes little steps in part B, and then it takes a huge jump when it go, goes from EC to EV. And the recombination event often results in a photon being emitted. <clears throat> So the question is, how could you use this method to, me uh, to measure the band gap of the material? How could you use this process to measure the band gap of the material? Yep. Yeah, it, it, can you say that again? Okay, the energy of the photons being emitted from the material. So this part C here, okay, we mentioned one way to measure the band gap, right? You tune the energy of the light going into the system, and you look at how much light is being absorbed. So we already talked about that. Now the second way... So you can look at if there's any light being given off? Yeah, you, exactly. You can look at any light being given off. Because the light that's being given off, well, if you convert that wavelength of light to a certain energy using E equals HC over lambda then you can calculate the band gap of the material. All right. So we're going to be doing an example problem next class. So I think these types of concepts will become more clear when you actually do the problem. But basically, like this, this process is uh, uh, how you determine the band gap of a material. Different LEDs give off different wavelengths of light, right? The uh, um, gallium arsenide gives off wavelengths of 9, 950 nanometers. This is a type of light bulb that's used in your remote controls for your TVs. Uh, uh, gallium nitride is uh, ultraviolet light. I'm sorry, blue. Uh, um, uh, blue light. Aluminum gallium arsenide is like red light. So they all have different band gaps. And ba based on what their band gap is, they give off light of specific wavelengths, specific colors. So a lot of the innovation in LEDs that happened um, happened because of they're able to create materials with the band gaps energies that they want. Okay. You know, this, this might seem a little bit boring to you, but uh, the person, uh, you know, just playing around with recipes, trying to find a material with a certain band gap. But the person who won the Nobel Prize last year was the guy who invented the blue LED. I don't know if any of you have heard, of, heard about the Nobel Prize last year. He spent years, he spent years trying to figure out uh, uh, the right recipe and the right process conditions to grow 
um, the material for uh, blue LEDs. Uh, I, there's an interesting story about him. I'll talk more, more about him last time so we can have enough time for the presentations today. So let's end there today. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>